home and our communities from Westbury and surrounding areas who are joining us live via YouTube. I only wish that we could have all been together today. I'd like to dock Doff my cap to our esteemed patron, Dr. Donato Francesco Matera. <laughs> and our dynamic keynote speaker, the young man, otherwise known as uh, Professor Jonathan Jansen. I'll introduce our panelists and speakers later, but thank you so much for accepting the invitation. It is a profound privilege for me to have been invited to officiate, if, uh, officiate on this glorious day. I'm, a broadcaster and an author. My name is Iman Repetti. You may catch me lurking in the shadows and in the news occasionally, if you care to, to check out where I am. But today represents the first. It is the first annual lecture dedicated to the work, the life, and most importantly, the legacy impact of a man whose words have served as a balm to the wounded a clarion call to the disaffected, a conscience to the apathetic, and bouquets of light in the darkness. And light could not be needed more as our country finds itself, sometimes navigating by touch, enveloped in a shroud of corruption, sadness, and need. And even though this was written a long time ago, it is apt for a moment such as this. Deja vu all over again. They think us happy because we hide our anguish in song, stamp our shackled feet until red drips from the cracks. They smile and we smile. We only smile because they smile and they think us happy. Let us remove our masks of artificial merriment, reveal the wrinkles of our quiet anchor, anger, wash the clay from our bodies and let them see the scars. Perhaps they know, perhaps they know not, but damn it, they must be told, we have had enough. Thank you to the Don Matera Legacy Foundation and the support from the Khao Train Management Agency for this love letter to a globally acclaimed author, poet, journalist, humanitarian, and children's rights activist. Thank you to the communities of people who've been affected, provoked, and changed through his work for accepting the invitation to join us in this moment. We are marking a legacy and long may it flourish and continue to catalyze change. The theme is the child in 2030 and throughout our program today you will hear more about the work that is done, the work that is still to be done with our partners in the, in the holy task of making sure that our children are kept safe. So I invite all of you to feel very welcome on this momentous day. And on that note, let me open the way for the chair of the Don Matera Legacy Foundation, Jenny Jefter. Good afternoon, honored guests gathered here today at the Radisson. In Santon, our guests at the Harvest Time Dome, where this event is being streamed live, and to all of you joining us from around the world online. Welcome to the inaugural Don Matera Lecture. The Don Matera Legacy Foundation was the brainchild of the late Dr. Leonard Martin, who identified a number of individuals who he believed shared the same vision he had, namely to establish a foundation with the purpose of preserving the legacy of Don Matera's lifelong work in various forms. And so this foundation was birthed in 2019 with a launch in 2020. So on behalf of the board members of the foundation, we express our gratitude to you for honoring us by participating in this event. It is poignant that we are hosting this event two years to the day that the national lockdown in South Africa came into effect. So much has happened over the past two years and we have all been impacted by the events of the past two years. And the fact that we are gathered here in person in this manner is in itself a huge privilege and a blessing. We are a non-profit organization and could never host an event like this without the generosity of others. So to all who have contributed to this event, whether in kind or in substance, we acknowledge you. However, it would be remiss of me not to acknowledge the Gautrain Management Agency. They have generously sponsored us 
and partnered with us, and in particular, I have to acknowledge the late Dr. Ingrid Jensen, who shared our vision in making our dream a reality. We are deeply indebted, Barbara, to you and your team, and we sh for, who have supported us in the planning and the organization of this event. Thank you very much. Don, today is your day. You are the reason why we are here today. We honor you, we pay tribute to you, and we celebrate you. We celebrate you for leading us and leading the way for us, paving the way for us. We thank you for teaching your direction, your instruction, your guidance. We thank you for your courage, your inspiration, and for being the embodiment of true humanity. We honor you for being that voice for the, to the voiceless and for being an advocate for the rights of all, including children. We are so enormously privileged to have you present here with us today. You are the reason we are gathered here today, and we want to say to you, we are because you are. It was Cicero who said the following, to be ignorant of what occurred before you were born is to remain always a child. For what is the worth of human life unless it is woven into the life of our ancestors by the records of history? So we as human beings cannot go forward unless we know where we come from. The focus of our lecture this year is the child. And this theme finds, it, finds its roots in Don Matera's deep value of compassion for the child and his concern for the future well-being of the child amidst a world that is constantly in turmoil. We thank our keynote speaker and our panelists who have so generously accepted our invitation to take the opportunity to expand on this theme and briefly share their insights and their perspectives with us today. It is our intention to host this lecture annually, and this would be regarded as our signature event. Honored guests, I now invite you to sit back, to relax, and enjoy this inaugural lecture with us. I thank you. Thanks so much um, for that, Jenny. I want to introduce our next guest, um, as Jenny said, without whose generosity we could not be sitting in the heights of Santon, darling. So here we are today, and um, I want to welcome Dr. Barbara Jensen Forster, who is um, with the Gauteng Management Agency. She is the Senior Executive Manager for Communication and Marketing. Feel very welcome, Barbara. It found us waking, waiting, long before others came to these hills. Our footsteps shaped the landscape, tamed the buffalo and the gemsbok. We rode the wind. We silenced the hurricane. Look at us. We have been here before. I cannot start this event with any other one's words but Tata Don's words. I cannot remember when this poem became part of my consciousness. It had been for so long that it had been become part of my DNA. I cannot write. But I can take some photos. I just came back from the Maasai Mara, and every morning the sun find me waiting for it. And every time that I don I press down my shutter. These words, when the first sun rose, it found us waiting, goes through my head. I yet have to f f take the ideal shot, that final shot when I can put down my camera and say, this is it. This photo, do your words justice. Hopefully it won't come too soon, 
because I still need to do a lot of travels into the womb of Africa. But this has been your words, and I hope some of my photos do it justice. But as Iman said, the, um, the, the Ingrid, one of my colleagues, and also my sister, started this process with the Don Matera Legacy Foundation. And sorry for that, for my emotion, because I'm standing in for her today. She cannot be here. She passed away of COVID in June last year. And Ingrid used to do this to me. She, I would be very busy, and she would come and stand in my doorway at the office and say, Barbara, in that tone of voice that, that I know, would cost me money in the end of that conversation. <laughs> um, and I would normally say no. <laughs> and she said, um, there's something I would like to do, or how train have to do with the Don Matero Foundation. And I said yes. Without <laughs> hesitation, without her telling me what this is going to be. And um, we started the long walk with them. This event has been arranged so many times and had been cancelled so many times due to the COVID pandemic. All of us sitting here, lives had been changed due to COVID. Whilst Ingrid, just after Ingrid passed and my mom passed 48 hours later, Tata Matera was also in hospital. And I just said, please God, don't take him as well. And we blessed for him to be with us today. When Ingrid, when Ingrid passed, um, it took some, it was in the height of COVID, the COVID passing, the height of um, the, th the third wave. Um, it, it took some time before I could get their ashes and took them to, to Paternoster, our, our family holiday home, to, to take their ashes to the sea. And I had a bunch, about 60 proteas that we put into the sea. And there was a tremendous storm that night. And one perfect protea washed out the, during the night. And I took that as Ingrid's way of saying to me, everything is going to be okay. And I had the protea tattooed on my, on my wrist. And there's someone put a protea in, in the front. And I, I truly believe that Ingrid is here today, Tata Don, that she's with us. And I found a poem you wrote about the protea. It's not a flower. It's a dome of fluttering flags, tombs of Africa, Africana relics, and monuments of ox wagon, dripped, dipped in blood. It's the flight of the black man's spear, flung in hostile fear of lost possession. Conquered manhood and broken pride. It is the tears of my bonded people falling on Pretoria's marble steps. The victims of subjugation. The Pretoria can never be a flower, not while the soul of South Africa struggles to be set free. I find it so incredible how I hated the Pretoria. I hated every symbol of the apartheid regime. And, but I found, I found how incredible it is how the Pratia became the bond between me and Ingrid. And I just found it incredible how this poem surfaced while I was reading your poems again. I want to leave you with a, the last poem that I, I want to read of, of Tata Don. And then I want you to, to leave him with, with Tata Madiba and with, with, with the arch 
with Mother Teresa and all those, and with Gandhi, all those great people. It's the, 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 the title is And Yet. I've known silences, long and deep as death, where the mind questioned the logic of my frailty. In the immense of my destruction, in the imminence of my destruction, by men ruled and ravaged by power lust, I've known deep silences, when thoughts like angry waves beat against the shores of my mind, revealing the scars of brutal memories and the murder of my manhood, and yet I cannot hate. Try as I want to, I cannot hate. Why? Barbara, how beautiful. And please accept all of our condolences on the loss of two of these, two of your jewels, really. I'm so sorry to hear that. We didn't know. And thank you for sharing so beautifully uh, and so deeply. Really appreciate you. I want to introduce um, our moderator for today, somebody who's going to curate this conversation. I am looking forward to it so much. Um, she is an award-winning veteran journalist, associate editor of the Daily Maverick. She's also been at the helm of both the Mail and Guardian and the City Press. She's also a colleague, but I call her my sister and friend, and sometimes we, we share tips about clothing and makeup. You've threatened our makeup today, Barbara. I spent three hours putting this face on, and I was going to cry. <laughs> <laughs> her name is Ferial Hafaji, ladies and gentlemen. Please give her a warm welcome. Thank you, lovely Iman. Um, Assalamu alaikum, Don Matera, and gathered guests. Alhamdulillah. Peace be upon you all. It's wonderful to be with you, and I hope that your dear sister and mama are resting in peace, Barbara. And thank you for sharing your story with us. So, before we get going, I am to say how I know Don. So I grew up in Westbury, Bosmont, and Nuclear, across those three suburbs, and I was perplexed by our oppression and by apartheid. And I remember just before the tricameral parliament was launching, coming into being, I attended a play by Don Matera at a community or a church hall in Westbury. And the words that stuck with me for helping to narrate and navigate that world, because it came about at a time where black people were being co-opted into the apartheid project, and where black and colored policemen, Indian as well, were the worst oppressors of our students and our people. And I remember that play where you said the poem, um, my one-time brother, my one-time friend. Um, and those words were so material to me. Your words, your poetry, your, your writing taught me about the liberating force of words to narrate our worlds at the time because they were appalling worlds for which you, didn't, you couldn't explain them very well. And also, more importantly, the power of words to press for a better world because often that was all that we had at our disposal. Obviously, later, uh, you were an associate editor of training at the Weekly Mail, and you trained a generation of us, this grand man, this Donato Francesco Matera, this Umari Dean Matera, would walk around in that newsroom with a scarf just like this one, I remember so well. Um, and I suppose, as I've thought about you, um, it was less that you taught us verbs or nouns or typing, that was somebody else's job. But what's most important is that you taught us to see ourselves differently in the world and to walk differently in the world. To walk with confidence, to stake a place and to take a place. And for that, many of us must thank you very, very deeply. So. 
So, Professor Jonathan Jansen is our keynote speaker today. We all know him very well. He is South Africa's educationist extraordinaire. He is an ambassador for children. He is a fine public intellectual with a finger to the pulse and a Twitter timeline that you absolutely must read if you don't already. He's a distinguished professor of education at Stellenbosch. He's a he is the president of the Academy of Social Sciences where he's doing marvelous work. And he is the previous and shape-shifting vice chancellor of the University of the Free State, a storied and awarded son of the soil. We very much look forward to hearing what you have to say to us today, Prof. Jonathan Jansen. Are you there? Can you hear? Hi, Cyril. Uh, let me just check whether you can hear me. We can hear you beautifully. Fantastic. Oh my word, two of my heroes on one stage, Firio and Iman, uh, what amazing people. And um, what an honor to, to deliver the inaugural Don Matera lecture today. I so, so wish I could have been there with you um, physically. Um, the title of my talk, which I thought about a lot um, in the case of, of uh, Bradon, is Unbowed and Unbought. And that, of course, is uh, drawn from uh, one of my favorite quotations by the scholar-intellectual Cornel West, um, uh, unbowed and unbought. And, and what I want to talk about very briefly is what Don Matera teaches us in a broken country. Now, um, when I first met uh, Don Matera, it was at the launch of my very first book, an edited volume called Knowledge and Power in South Africa. The publisher at the time was uh, Scoteville, uh, Scoteville Publishers, and I think uh, Don was uh, uh, one of the directors. But what I remember as a young academic from that special evening in Bramfontein was the felt presence of this formidable man and how respected and loved he was in that assembly of people in the early 90s. I knew then what I had already suspected from his writings, that this was a very special human being. And for that reason, among others, it is an incredible honor to, to be able to, to honor uh, 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 the great Don Matera. Now, um, <laughs> I cannot say his names with that wonderful Italian accent of um, uh, 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 Iman, but uh, Donato Francisco Matera is, is a man, it seems to me, who defies classification. Um, and that is a very difficult thing to say in a country that has made a fetish out of fixing people's identities in terms of race, ethnicity, religion, and the like. But Don Matera actually defies in his very life and, and his living uh, any form of classification. Let me give you a few examples. How many people do you know who um, had an Italian grandfather? His own father was colored. Uh, whatever that means, and his mother African. How is it that you could have in one person a violent uh, gangster who also achieved the peace prize uh, of the World Health Organization in 1997? How do you have an activist who received banning orders under one regime and national orders under another regime. For those of you who are curious about the latter, it was the order of Ikamanga in silver uh, uh, in 1997. Here you have a man who fights with sharp knives at one point and then with sharp words at another point. As a poet, as a writer, as a journalist, as a playwright. Here you have a man who is a Muslim, but the product of a Catholic convent school, and who in one of his poems quotes from Christian hymns 
such memorable lines as fast falls the even tide and when other helpers fail. For the curious, um, these are uh, words from Abide With Me, a very famous Christian hymn, which was composed by a Scottish Anglican in 1861. Here you have a man who once destroyed lives and now has become one of the most iconic community builders of our times. And finally, here you have a man who joined the National Forum because he believed the UDF was not racially inclusive. Uh, uh, Don, you left to help me understand that one <laughs> at some point and so on. But clearly, a man who defies classification. What is the point of this, uh, of what I've said so far, that in his life and in his learning and indeed in his loves, Don demonstrate what it really does mean to be a citizen in a democracy, or as my friend John Samuel puts it, you know, he teaches us through his life the habits of democracy. What does that mean? It means that you cannot and should not be defined by origins, by who your parents were or where they came from. It means not allowing others to define who you are. It means not to be trapped in some given identity. It also means not to be constrained by political loyalties and not to be defined by your past. At no time in our history is this more important, this kind of commitment, than now. The organized attacks on foreign nationals, especially those from other African countries, is deeply, deeply disturbing. Somebody tweeted the other day because of my tweets on uh, going after these people, uh, said on Twitter, once we have deported them, we are coming to deport you. Uh, and, and I found that very very interesting, uh, which is fine, except I'd like to know in advance where you're going to deport me to. That would be, that would be most interesting. You make a huge mistake, ladies and gentlemen, if you think this is only about organized gangs like Dudula or frustrated township residents. It is also our government in a dangerous messaging throughout the civil service to do head counts of non-South African employees. Worse, in some of our universities, there are now EE policies that make it virtually impossible to hire academic talent from other African countries. <clears throat> Let me just uh, divert here for a second. I don't know a lot, but I know a little bit about universities. The one thing I can tell you, no university, no university, becomes great in its development, in its research, in its teaching, when it only re relies on the natives, if you know what I mean, on us, on the locals. No university in the world. It is an extremely stupid idea to think that you can build training and development and research institutions without taking the word university seriously, which means the universe of talent, the universe of ideas, the universe of... Uh, anyway, UCT's new policy on employment is one such example as a despicable document, and it should uh, not be allowed to go ahead um, to basically cut out. Um, and I, I ask you to remember what our universities would look like without the Cameroonian Akilimbembe at Wits University. I ask you to imagine what Stellenbosch University would look like with one of the most highly cited scientists in the world uh, uh, in the agricultural sciences, uh, sciences. I ask you to imagine what UCT would look like without Francis Niampo 
and, so, and I, you would collapse the University of Fort Hare, that I know for a fact, if you had this kind of policy uh, against African nationals uh, in, in Ellis and East London. It is absolutely despicable thinking. And so don't fool yourself to think that this is only about, you know, poor people in the townships. This is also about the civil service. And I'm ashamed to say it is also about our universities. As I read Don's work, I suspect a very strong pan-African solidarity that energizes his thinking. Think of this beautiful poem he writes, wrote Zimbabwean love song. Sing and dance, sons, daughters of Zimbabwe. It is the call of a timeless glory and the heat, the beat of the native song that beckoned you to struggle on. Nana Zimbabwe, it was your dance of daring feet which set the bush ablaze, made the dying sweet. Sing and dance, daughters and sons of Zimbabwe. It is the rooster that sings of children marching against the wind. The white knight is dead. Freedom walks in the sunrise and in the glow of an eternal love song. I'm sending this to all my Zimbabwean friends on Monday. The further point of the discussion so far is of, of a man who denies classification, is that Don moves around a lot, like somebody else whom I just had the pleasure of recording um, a, uh, a lecture of this kind, Delsa September. Um, he cannot find a place in a single political group he moves. And this allows the man a fierce independence. In other words, he is, to use old language, his own man. <clears throat> Nor can he be tied down to any particular religious sect, for as Don himself put it, the highest religion <laughs> is compassion. I love that. The highest religion is compassion. Um, I, I fret very often when I look at you know, where I grew up, uh, which was essentially evangelical faith, and I look at the right-wing evangelicals across the world, particularly in the U.S. at the moment, and I think people have just forgotten the very simple compassions that should guide your life. Things like... Things like love your neighbor as yourself. Um, things like it is, you know, better to give than to receive. Uh, uh, things like, you know, welcoming the stranger. That's actually what all faiths, all Abrahamic faiths are about. And yet we don't live this highest form of religion, which Don calls compassion. He belongs, but he is not owned by any party or any faith or anyone. Now contrast this with the ANC officials in Cape Town, who in the middle of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, went for celebratory drinks at the Russian consulate to commemorate a political relationship. They are owned. They lack independence. They lack integrity. It is they of whom Don Matera wrote, they crawled for the colonial crumbs of comfort and sold their souls for money. Contrast that sniveling position with the white comrades that Don Matera once described, men and women of conscience who sacrificed their days that others might be free. What drives a man who cannot be classified is that conscience lies at the center of his life as a development activist. He said this more than once. My personal mission is to remove pain and suffering from people's lives. This is not supposed to sound profound in democratic South Africa, and yet it is, for it stands in contrast to what so many in our government does. Three examples quickly, the utter decay and dysfunction 
of some of our public hospitals. The fact that there are still hundreds of pit littering toilets in many of our public schools, the demise of almost every one of the SOEs. Why? Not because of a lack of competence, but because of a lack of integrity. It sometimes feels as if our country is in an ethical free fall. And three things happened recently that, you know, I'm a very optimistic person like Don. I believe in the children. I believe in, you know, country's future and so on and so forth. Um, but the other day on Twitter, I saw a man running <laughs> with the robots, the traffic lights, you know, that long yellow pole with the, with the light fixtures still at the other end. <laughs> and all those heavy electrical cables inside. And because it was heavy, he had to come up to breathe every few you know, minutes. And there the camera was tracking this man, stealing the robots. And somebody in one of the captions said, steal until there is nothing left to steal. What has become of us? This is not what Don talks about. His mission is <laughs> the opposite. Um, Ferial, in fact, I think posted something about, I think it was one of her relatives taking a photo from across the road, showing people literally uprooting a bus shelter and putting it on the back of the bucky. So the robots goes, the bus shelter goes. And I work with schools, as you know, a lot. And the other day I went to a school in an area where I grew up, where everything in that school is stolen. That school is as 45 as Paulsmore Prison, a, a few kilometers away. Everything gets stolen, and there's nothing left to steal. And then I realized how depraved we are. The school planted grass, just to beautify the place a little bit, Pond planted a bit of grass in front of the school. Do you know that these gangsters jumped over the fence at night, dug up the grass, and went to probably sell it somewhere? I mean, it's not just that we have a corrupt government um, that seems to have gone over the edge. It is that ordinary citizens now also believe that, you know, since they steal at the top, I have one life, let me steal at the bottom. This is not to remove pain and suffering from people's lives, but Don, didn't you get the memo, almost steal? The truth is, that there are thousands of Don Materials around the country and in every province that keep this country together. We have more NPOs than all other African countries combined. We have a functional civil society in a highly dysfunctional state. What is special? As I move towards the conclusion, what is special about Don Matera's approach is that he puts children, as you heard before, and in that little um, track at the center of his development commitments. And this comes out beautifully in any number of his poems. Under apartheid, he wrote, no children. There are no children in Soweto, Langa, Manenberg. They are dead, jailed, crippled blinded, tortured. If it stopped there, you wouldn't have, you have a real picture, but you wouldn't have the complete picture because in song for this child, those very children give us life. Let this child's bright eyes conquer the cold darkness, shine across the tortured earth. These children, in other words, <laughs> lift us from despair as he says in Child, the poem Child, and children again came, again came, pure and cleansing. The children planted a new Africa for a new world. I believe that Don Matera's deep and broad involvement in the lives of the children of El Dorado Park and elsewhere is driven by this faith that the future restoration of our humanity and the security of our country lie with his youth. It is a vision that I share and one that I support. So
So finally, how can we thank you today, Don Matera, for showing us how to live our lives? You're right in child. What do men or women live for? if not to be remembered by their beloved. I want to assure you, Don, this afternoon, that you are well remembered and that you are deeply loved. Thank you. Another round for Don. Thank you very much, Professor Janssen, for that beautiful inaugural lecture on the unbound, the unbought Don Matera, taking us all the way from our past to this very moment um, and making us reflect not only on all that we don't have, but what we do have, um, wonderful civil society, very important people doing work in the nonprofit sector. Thank you so much, Johnson. I believe that you have to leave us, so we will say farewell to you as we call on our panelists to join us. So much so our panel will now respond to the inaugural lecture by Professor Jonathan Jansen. Um, we are joined by a woman who is always there. Whenever you hear about a child in distress, um, Dr. Shahida Omar, the director of the Teddy Bear Clinic, is the most eloquent public advocate for the rights of the child. She joins us just being mic'd up there. We also join. We also join by Dr. Tahir Setoto, who is a lecturer in the School of Religion, Philosophy, and Classics at the University of KwaZulu Natal. I read with great interest that he wrote his thesis on the life of Don Matera, and he will provide us with reflections on that. Very welcome to both of you. Just getting the mics done. We'll start with Dr. Omar. So let's give it a few minutes to get sorted. Thank you so much, guys. Very welcome, Dr. Shaida Omar, to reflect on the topic of today, the inaugural lecture, is on the child in 2030. As someone who has, who has every day we see you, we hear you, protecting the rights of the child, perhaps you could tell us what the picture is and also what the future is for a few moments. Thank you, Ferriel. Is it on? Can you hear me? No. Not yet. Try again, please. Can you hear me now? Now? No. I wonder if you want to come over here. Okay. Is that okay? That's fine. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Come with universal greetings. Good afternoon. Namaste. Assalamu alaikum. Goyamidah. And a special, special thank you for allowing me this amazing opportunity to honor a legend who is legendary and somebody that we can never ever replace. Yes, people are indispensable, but some people remain invaluable and leave imprints and footprints on our heart that never leave us. So once again, this is a humbling opportunity. It really humbles me that I'm privileged to have been part of this auspicious and momentous occasion. I would like to reflect on the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, that we speak to 2030 
And I'm going to just focus on a few which I feel are so critical and essential in the lives of our children. As we've heard before, the voiceless, giving the voices to the voiceless, the invisible who are wounded and continue to be subjected to brutality, even as we speak. So looking at poverty, zero hunger, the food insecurity, the injustices that children suffer, that even as we speak, children are suffering from malnutrition, good health and well-being, something that we look out for but we're not finding out there, quality education, gender equality, and then clean water and sanitation, something that we take for granted, a fundamental right according to section 27 of the Constitution. And if we just look at that, if we unpack that, according to our Deputy President, David Mabuza, um, his response was that government does not have the capacity to fix the water issues. This explanation is unacceptable. We find that 64% of the population have access to, six, uh, to safe drinking water. 9% draw their water from polluted rivers and springs, only to arrive before animals come to reach out for drinking water. And having been to the Eastern Cape, going to deep rural Lutsikisiki, where you see young girls, five-year-old girls carrying buckets on their head, carrying water, commuting kilometers to have access to drinking water, women and girls. So if we look at SDGs 2030, where are we? Where are we heading to? And I think this is just something that we need to appreciate and recognize where compassion is the highest order of religion, but where's compassion here? Yeah. What is happening on the ground? By 2050, Africa will be having one billion children. Currently, the majority do not enjoy equal opportunities and do not develop to their full potential. The African Child Policy Forum has called this a ticking time bomb for Africa. And all members of the African Union, including South Africa, have endorsed Africa's Agenda 2063 and Africa's Agenda for Children 2040, recognizing that inclusive, sustainable development of the continent depends on realizing the rights of all children to secure their equal and optimal development. Something that I want to just remind you, and I mean, we all sit and listen to media hypes and we all get worked up and upset, and it's about violence on children, on violence against children, which is definitely an important issue, but children's equal and optimal development is a sustainable development priority. If we just look at the school closures during the COVID period, school closures in South Africa resulted in the loss of 200 days, equivalent to one and a half years of one and a half years long lasting implications. Being out of school for that long means that children do not just stop learning, but also tend to forget what they've learned. And also opportunities for social engagement and giving result to behavioral disorders, mental disorders, the anxiety, the depression, and all sorts of other unintended consequences. But if we talk about unintended consequences, we also need to look at the food insecurity, the injustices that children suffered. 66% of children suddenly did not have food when the National Nutrition Feeding Scheme came to an abrupt end during the lockdown period. There was no forethought, no planning, and many families suffered as a loss, as a, a result of that, until uh, the EEL took
took it upon themselves. We went to the High Court. We, Teddy Bear Foundation for Abuse Children, submitted affidavits supporting this, and we were successful in that application. But one just needs to appreciate that during the lockdown period, we found children in the informal settlements outside of Soweto where they were scraping the bottom of dustbins. They had no food, and these children were ranging from five years old to 11 year old children. Uh, so I just want to bring that to everybody's attention. We know that most of the impact will be on children and youth who happen to be between the ages of four and 24 years in 2020 and 2021, generating a huge intergenerational inequality. But I want to also remind everybody that a significant proportion of the budget spent goes to grants. This is absolutely necessary, but not enough on its own to shift human capital development. And if we just look at the challenges, the South African National Rights Coalition, together with UNICEF South Africa, appeal to the president to profile children's rights to nurturing care and protection. It must be a national sustainable development priority. It must be advanced by all organizations of the state working in collaboration with civil society, business, the media, and other development partners. However, the path that has been chosen neglects children and focuses exclusively on business-driven economic recovery and little on social, civil, and political recovery. The president's focus is on the private sector and how it can unleash the dynamism of the economy of deep concern is that there is absolutely no mention of the importance of enabling ch nurturing environments to unlock the development potential of the country's greatest growing asset. And that is, of course, its children, the children of the country, the children of South Africa. The president emphasized from the outset that the focus will be on the same priorities. This I'm refl reflecting on the SONA, as in the previous year, overcoming the COVID-19 pandemic, a massive rollout of infrastructures, a substantial increase in local production. He even said local is lacquer and spoke about his suit being manufactured by a local um, company. Uh, an employment stimulus to create jobs and sub support livelihoods, the rapid expansion of our generation, energy generation capacity. So at the end of the day, it was all about business environment and job creation. The only mention made of children in the SONA was the following fragment, quote unquote, many children still have to brave overflowing rivers to reach schools. And this struck a chord in me because when I spent time working in Lutsikisiki, we saw children who were carrying books, had to cross lagoons to get to school and remove their shoes, their socks, carried everything, their books, go, went across and had to come back in the evening. So this was, is a reality, but I think it's more severe than we realize. And that was the only reference that was made to children. Um, I think something that our father, Don Matera, Tate Matera, has spoken about is let the children decide. Where are the children's voices in all of this? Why are the children not allowed to engage and participate? And I think our president failed to mention the children's parliament and their demands for advancing their rights and the country's development. We need a strong child rights governance system. That is a governance system that explicitly and deliberately places the realization of children's rights at the center of all policies, institutional arrangements and progress 
and that monitors progress in increasing the continent, continent's human capital index. And we find that this is invisible, an invite for children to participate in the development of, for a new general comment on the economics, on the social and cultural rights. Who better to inform us than children? And in conclusion, I would like to say that the National Plan of Action is documented. Yes, we have everything beautifully, eloquently articulated on paper, but not implemented. Children are invisible in the budget. SONA addresses a major political party. What SONA says, we need to have a major, major political parties rethink on children put pressure on government to focus on the position of children. Emphasis is on grants and uh, academic achievement is very important. However, missing out on the psychosocial development of children, advancing children's rights are even greater. If we look at the political party manifestos, it's nothing about the development of children. Violence is preventable preventable, mental health and sexual and reproductive health and rights can be ameliora ameliorated with trauma care and intervention. Lives can change. Hope can be restored. Res resilience can be built. Rights can be upheld. The evidence is there. Together we can all do it. This is a clarion call to action now, kinako, it's time now. And I just want to end on a very important thing that children are born but champions are made. Uh, in the Bantu Nguni term, umuntu umuntu inga Bantu. I am because we are. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Shahid Omar, for taking us right to the heart of the topic of today, the child in South Africa, and showing us how word is often 25,000 miles from deed. Um, next to give us his reflections is Dr. Tahir Setoto, who has written his thesis on the life and meaning of Don Matera. Is that working, Dr. Tahir? Is it working there? Okay. Yeah. I think better when I'm on my feet. <laughs> <laughs> if you do not mind. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Let me begin by invoking compassion, because it was compassion that moved Omaruddin Matera. We were given a brief that the first two minutes, as respondents, should state what is your connection with this wonderful human being. And so I'm not going to try and be eloquent this afternoon. I'm going to try and speak from their heart. I met Don Matera through one of the classics of South African poetry, but also through one of the classics of South African autobiographical writing. A Zanian love song and memory, memory is the weapon. But later on, we met him as activists in the various youth movements, namely amongst them, the Muslim youth movement, where he would grace our tarbiya or training programs. 
But to fast forward, little did I know that later on in my life, I would devote an entire academic study and a disclaimer chair that thesis was not on the life of, of Dr. Omaruddin Don Matera. That thesis sought to answer a question that Dr. Don Matera posed to me when I sought his consent when I was about to embark on a doctoral study that would foreground his work. And it was not about his life, rather it was to search the South African literary archives and ask why, as Raphael um, the Abdon has eloquently captured it, why has the canon Don Matera, I quote Raphael the Abdon on his recent piece of writing, commenting partly on the PhD, doing a critique of the PhD, uh, amongst other things, but also he asked this profound question and he says, Don Matera, the poet's poet forgotten by the canon. The poet's poet forgotten by the canon. And therefore, when we were asked to be respondents, we did not take it as a form of entitlement. We are not entitled to be here. We are not entitled to be here. We are here to honor somebody, someone who embodies compassion. Don Matera is the embodiment of compassion. When I was a student at UCT, I was working on the streets penniless. As students, we are always penniless. And I met Dada Don Matera on the corridors. He was invited as a speaker by the Black Consciousness Movement on campus. He did not ask. He went straight into his pocket and took some notes and said, take it, don't ask me. He said, take it. And that is Don Matera. A selfless individual, a selfless individual. And therefore, chairperson, organizers, the leadership of the Don Matera legacy and the entire Don Matera family. We are humbled to be present here today. That's why we could not miss this event, not COVID withstanding. We said, we will come. And therefore, I also want to acknowledge my soulmate, my twin, uh, who woke me up early in the morning and said, you cannot afford to miss the flight to Johannesburg. <laughs> Otherwise, you will miss the event. And so thanks to her. We were asked to be respondents to the keynote address by Professor Jonathan Johnson. And I want to turn to the address itself by summing it up. If I were to sum up Professor Jonathan Johnson's address without repeating what he has said, I would say in a nutshell, Professor Jonathan's address, amongst other things, says to us, who are gathered here, it says to us, to paraphrase, why Don Matera met us today more than yesterday? And I would paraphrase and say a discursive 
on the need for a disgustful suspension of Miko and Mandela. On a need for a discursive suspension for Biko and Mandela. Why don't Matera met us today more than yesterday? Uh, uh. And don't get me wrong, I'm not dissing, I'm not disrespecting the Mataya, Bantu, Stephen Biko, nor am I trivializing the sacrifice of Tata Nelson Mandela. But I'm saying, I'm saying as Kilian, Yasmin Kilian, in one of the early elementary studies on John Matera. Grazie, grazie, grazie Donato. In the transition moment, in an honest piece of work, that was written on the eve of what? The moment after apartheid? <laughs> she said, South Africa needs Don Matera today. <laughs> we need to pay more attention to him. Yes. And therefore, as the respondents are here, why are you saying suspend? Biko and Mandela for a moment. Well, in a nutshell, Chair, without taking your time, Mandela was compromised by political office. Yes. 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 I'm not dissing, I'm not distress, disrespecting Nelson Mandela, but political office, political office compromised him. Yes. And what about Stephen Bantu Biko? Mm. He was fortunate. This is a paradox. Mm. Matayadom took his life and saved him from the trauma that we witness today. Yes. But Don Matera tells us in a very profound way he could have occupied any key government position had he wished. Yes. Yes. Had he wished. And therefore, yes, Professor Jonathan Johnson is correct when he framed his keynote address by saying unbowed and unbought. Yes. Uh, unbowed and unbought. And Don Matera qualifies this by saying, we live by the consequences of our actions and our decisions. Yes. Even it means, even it means we will suffer in the dignity of poverty. We will not sell ourselves to the highest bidder. Yes. Yes. Professor Jonathan Johnson says this man sitting in our midst defies classification. Uh -huh. When I was trying to make sense out of his archive, and by the way, it was a self-funded study. I did not get any bursary. <laughs> I went to the archives in Grangetown. I went to the Vitz archives and many other archives, taking taxis and buses. And I was amazed at the profound writings by Don Matera. Yes. And therefore, yes, it was not on his life, but on his intellectual contribution. <laughs> and trying to make sense of this question when he asked me, which Don Matera will you focus on, son? Which Don Matera will you leave out? 
And when I tried to make sense of that question, I reverted, I resorted to black African existential philosophy and taught as a theoretical anchor to make sense of this multifaceted individual, intellectual, journalist, poet of significance. And I framed the thesis as on the idea of Africana Islamic existential philosophy, Don Matera and the question of transcendence. Mm -hmm. And so what Professor Johnson is talking about when he says he defies classification, Don Matera answered that in one word and said, I am the story of transcendence. I'm the best African there is. I am the best African there is. Yes, really. And Don Matera and those yes. that have written on him, yes, uh, I've argued, they have conscripted him, they have confined him to what I've termed the hermeneutic of struggle and protest. But yet, he should be better understood through the hermeneutic of transcendence because he transcends, he defies. He defies, to quote Professor Johnson, classification. <laughs> and therefore, it should better be understood through the hermeneutic of transcendence because he embodies transcendence. He embodies transcendence. Grazie. Time permitting, I would have dwelt on and say, in concluding, transcendence and compassion as an ethical category with particular reference to Don Matera. And this is what he leaves us with. This is what he leaves us with. Mm. Yes, I agree. I wish the children were here. Mm. I wish we would sit and listen to the children as Pradona so eloquently put it years ago. And yet his words speak today. And hence I have said, you cannot say this person's, this man's, Poetry is a poetry of protest. It is not a poetry of protest. Yes, it does speak to the political, but yet it transcends the political. Mm. It is transhistorical. It can be read at all times, even today. And so yes, let the children decide, not me. It by Don Matera. Hey, Tada. Let us hold this quibbling of reform and racial preservation, saying who belongs to which nation. Let the children decide it is their world. Radon, we salute you. Amanda. We salute you. Amen. And the Matera clan. Amen. And the leadership. Amen of this foundation mm. for ensuring that your memory, as you have taught us, mm. that your memory lives on. Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, oh. Very strong. for that transcendent response to the inaugural lecture. It was beautiful and will bring the words back to us. And thank you both for a passionate response to Professor Jansen. Elvis, I want to check if we do have time for questions. Yes? OK, we have time for just a couple of questions or comments, um, comrades, before we end today's wonderful proceedings. I have a mic here. Are there any thoughts? I think that Dr. Tyre has got us all. If there are later, 
Anybody? No? That's fine then. Thank you very much to our two panelists for your, your, your passionate responses today and thank you so much for sh telling us about transcendence and the importance of the canon, the work of Don Matera. I hand back to Iman now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yo, Tahir took us to church, he took us to the temple and he took us to the mosque. I thought it was Friday, it sounded like one of those rousing khutbas that you hear from the member, and I'm sure that it's going to spark a lot of discussion wherever you were, wherever you are today. A lot of limpid minds to quote something from the 80s and the struggle that have been detonated in this place today. A lot of food for thought and a lot of conversation, and that ultimately is the point of gatherings like this. A legacy foundation is not brick and mortar. It lives in our communities. It spreads the gospel of change and of conscience. It tells our children, it tells our neighbors, it tells our friends what to read. It tells them what is available so that we can stay alive and connected to the work that we still need to do in our society today. Uh, I just want to thank both of you for doing such a brilliant job of synthesizing those important thoughts. Shahida again reminding us that everything pivots around our children. Jonathan for doing such a stunning job as always of provoking us to think and Tahir again raising our consciousness. And as we resonate and reflect on the experiences of your life, Pradhan and Tate Don, the depths of its struggles and the heights of its realized potential, I thought about an interview you did once and the engravings, the story of your life leaves on us. I thought about your scars. Nine scars, nine lives and lifetimes. Your words as wisdom's old wine in the new skin of our today. They are both sermon and they are medicine. Thank you for your life. Mm. On that note, all good things have to come to an end, even our time in Sant and Barbara. So I want to call on the Deputy Chair of the Don Matera Legacy Foundation to close proceedings. Dr. Teddy Matera, the floor is yours. My friend, what does he have his doctorate in? Hmm? What does he have his doctorate in? He's, 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 um he was in university, and he got... Uh, Greetings, everyone. I am the easy part <laughs> of, um, of the proceedings for today. Um, a vote of thanks. Um, thank you for your, your words to both of you. Um, it has moved me immensely. I want to thank, first of all, the How Train Management Agency. Can we give them a round of applause, please? <laughs> and, the, and the Radisson Hotel for their generosity, providing a platform and this venue through the sponsorship and to make this inaugural lecture possible. <laughs> to Bishop Dalton from the Harvest Time Dome in Claremont, a great thank you for your generosity and kindness in spirit, and a big away for the people in Westbury. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to all our esteemed guests present here at the Radisson Hotel and at the Westbury Claremont Harvest Time Dome, and for the many who are watching online. To the captains of industry who have taken their time to come here to this event, and obviously to the creative arts organizations and the respected entrepreneurs amongst us, thank you for being here today. <laughs> but most of all, to the people of whom Don Matera speaks of in his literature, his poems, his actions, and as a human rights activist, we celebrate you today. Most important vote of thanks today is for the children all over the world. The child, my child, your child, her child, their child, are all our children. It is through this word that we've heard endlessly today that is manifest in Don Matera. 
It is through the compassion of Don Matera, where his life's work has demonstrated his love for children, which has made this gathering possible. Let the children decide. And now for a bit of what we have not spoken about today. So while war wages in different parts of the world and millions are displaced, thousands are killed and many more injured, especially the children, let us not forget, let us not forget the oppressed worldwide who've lost their land and lost their beloved. From Palestine to Uzbekistan to the Middle East to the Ukraine, to all over the world, it is important for us that we remember the children. The participants who have applied their minds today. Ferio, we thank you. Iman, thank you. Dr. Sitoto and Shaira Omar, we thank you. Our respondents have been amazing in how they've addressed our keynote speaker, Jonathan, um, Janssen's address, and we thank him immensely. Could we please have an applause for them? <laughs> to the Matera family who are here, I am going to do the unusual. Could you please stand up? There's a, there's a great clan melody. Please stand up. There's an entire clan and an extended family who are also online in Westbury listening, so thank you very much. Oh. To our beloved board members, our chair, our workers, everybody in this organization who give of themselves in every possible way to have made this occasion the launch and the way forward possible, and those in Westbury of our, our membership um, to the board who are there, we salute you and we thank you all. Can we please give our, our members a, a round of applause as well? It, it would be dishonorable, dishonorable of me not to ask for this moment. I'd like you all to please stand up me. No, no. no, not you. <laughs> it is about you. <laughs> and I'd like us to honor our patron, Don Matera. <laughs> our patron, Don Matera. Do you sing? occasion, thank you, you may sit down. Thank Could you. we please ask Shaquille Preslin, who's got an offering to make for us, to Dr. Don Matera, please come here. I'm done. He's just going to do a small poem for Don. Okay. Good afternoon, family. Um, it's an honor to be here and to be invited to render a poem which is very close to my heart. It's a baby of mine, yeah. and I hope you'll all enjoy it. <laughs> Our environment. Plants, animals, and global warming, all these issues are important, but what about the urban environment? Cars, these ghettos, hoods, us people of color constantly misunderstood. Left on the side, guided by a system like we blind, lies and truths interweave manipulation and indoctrination is all we breathe. Our environment, where you eat or be eaten, where the stronger survives, where substances, money and materialism rules our lives, takes our minds, distorts our time. Our environment, where every day is the same, filled with cries and complaints. Bodies on the corners is just an ordinary mundane. Dead or alive, before you realize, in terms of a compromise, there's always a sacrifice. Our environment. We our girls don't know their worth. Having low self-esteem from the moment of birth. She believes her beauty is a curse, looking for love by lustful men who just want to be entertained. They call it equivalent exchange, but baby girl is selling her innocence, her body, 
for just a little change. Our environment. We help boys do what they can with blood soaked hands, trying to find a definition of being a man. Having a heart is weak, that's all we understand. A false sense of loyalty to betrayal. Criminality is all we hail, we believe we are bound to fail, so we adopt the streets as our own. It's the only place we ever truly known, the only place we feel we belong. Where there's no such thing as integrity. Where we lie, we steal, we cheat for small amounts of economy. Our environment. Where to dream is taboo. Where having hope is hopeless. Where we hate on achievements but give praise to disappointments. Where there's no line between right or wrong, good or bad, happy or sad. The only happiness comes from happenings we're expressing through emotions is obscene. Our environment. We have no sense of our identity. It is stripped away. Our culture, our heritage, our history. Maybe that's why we handle situations so violently. We do not know where we come from. In reality, we held ransom. Slaves under a constitution. Democracy was supposed to be the solution. Instead, it was a continuation. Reverse segregation upon our own nation. Mm. Our environment. There's a lot of issues we face. But out of my environment, I envision something great. Throughout all the bad, we still overcome. Trials and tribulations made us strong. That's the reason why I wrote this poem. For my brothers and sisters to realize there's no time to compromise. We need to open, eye, open up our eyes to the truth that we are kings and queens of this land. The impossible is in our hands. It's a simple thing we got to understand. My environment, your environment, our environment. Thank you. Wow, that was powerful. And again, it just proves your hope, I think, Brad Don, that the legacy that you leave lives and lives and lives and continues and lives. That was amazing. Thank you so much. T Teddy's background uncle. Come, Teddy. <laughs> I, I wanted to, excuse me, man. Um, we have um, gifts for, for all of you. Um, we've had um, Don Matera's um, Memories, the Weapon, republished, which we would like to offer on sale outside, but also to our guests today, including yourself. So um, <laughs> let's start off with Dr. Shaida Omar. We'd like to offer Dr. Sitoto. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Barbara Jensen also, a copy for you, please. You. Bishop Dalton. Thank you. Is not here with us, but we'll tape a copy. On behalf of, will you accept the book on behalf of Bishop Dalton? Okay, I mean, please come to this. And um, Dr. Sitoto, can we trust you to give you um, Dr. Janssen's, uh, Professor Janssen's <laughs> book? <laughs> will, it, will it reach him? <laughs> thank you very much, thank you, man. Just to mention that in, in the past for the guests, there was 500 grand voucher from How Train, so they can travel with the How Train. Well, you know, that's what's so nice about being in places like these. There's also a voucher inside, so we can all use the How Train. <laughs> Thank you so much again. This wouldn't be possible with all this, without all the sponsors, so really, really do appreciate your continued support. All that's left for me to say is such a heartfelt thank you. I'm just, again, so, as you said, it is a privilege to be in an environment like this, to have 
brought Don with us. We're having this lecture with you, and that is such an amazing gift, and we're so grateful. Um, I want to invite everyone here um, to please enjoy a lunch with us. And for those of you who've joined us online, thank you so much for your time and your attention. Please do continue the conversations and lend a hand. It's one thing to applaud and be inspired, but real inspiration is about your the works that you do. So let us all go back to our communities and do the work. And lastly, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you so much. Donato Francesco Mater. My son's name is Monapule Lebake. I was here born in 1935. Two is it not? Western Native Township. Um, just your attention as you file out and you enjoy the refreshments. I was talking about getting involved. The projects that you can support are in the brochure. Please do sign up today. We're, we're taking names. Please do commit and thank you so much again. last night oh, for there was a young Congolese girl yeah. I will send you the recording uh -huh. beautiful she Masha talks Allah. of displacement and migration yes. Allah Alhamdulillah she was amazing and there was yeah. a Palestinian girl also mm. there's young poets coming through Masha but their minds Allah well I had my life I had, I led, I had my life so I can I can run all the time. Every day, Alhamdulillah. Allah Allah. Muslim is deep in my heart and the Christian. It's one. <laughs> Allah is one. Allah yeah, is one. one. Is one. Some young love want to talk yes, people to want to see you. Alhamdulillah. Welcome to the became a Muslim. Assalam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Illa Allah Muhammad Dur Rasulullah. Right now, 
our culture, our art, our literature is a reality of protest, a reality of revolution and resistance. Our art shows the white man what he is. We show him his true image, and he looks and he sees, but he does not like what he sees. So he destroys that mirror called art, and tragically, he kills the artist. We contend, many of us contend, there are two kinds of writers in the world. Those who watch from a safe vantage point how people are suffering mm. and uh, write about that suffering from the goodness of their heart. Mm -hmm. Then there are those who are with the people in the trenches fighting. Mm. So I believe, and I say this with humility, that I was that kind of writer and I earned the title, the poet of the liberation movement, the bard of the liberation movement. So my writing w was in tandem with the struggle. You see our young people today, they are the victims of a great, terrible tragedy that took place in this country. They, we, who said we were the liberators, the leaders, we took them out of the classrooms into the streets to fight and die for us. Now, these young people, circumstances have created the conditions for them and for me, adverse circumstances, that have militated against their being, against their progress. But now, we must take charge of our lives. We must seize the time together with the young people. We can remold and refashion this country and help to remold and fashion their lives as well. But the poet can't always stop at destruction. And Wali Saruti says to me, and he tells me about this, Don, we must give our people hope. We cannot always depict this, this, this suffering and this pain and this blood. We must give them hope. For too long have they been fed in despair. It's a pleasure, thank you. You and I and our government we have to work for the child. Because if we don't work for the child, there will be no country again. We must go out of our ways to protect the child. Because this one was not protected.